Hello everyone, this is Experiment Science in Computer Science, Week 3, Statistical Inference, Part 2, Statistical Test Procedure. I'm Klaus and let's get this class started. Alright, so in the last lecture, in the last video, we talked about uh, the process for the new hypothesis statistical testing, which is we select a new hypothesis H0 and a uh, alternate hypothesis 8.1, we get some experiment and we see which of the hypothesis is more supported by the experiment. In this video, we're going to talk about a little bit how do we exactly do that. So, given a good hypothesis, the objective of statistical test is to answer the question, do we have enough evidence to prefer the alternate hypothesis to the new hypothesis? Or, as sometimes you're going to hear, can we reject the new hypothesis? So the general procedure is that we're going to calculate an estimate for our parameter of interest, and we're going to see if this estimate fall into what we call a rejection region. So we have our parameter of interest, which is the mean COCOA, and we calculate what region this mean would fall that would say we must reject the new hypothesis and prefer the alternate hypothesis, and what region we would say we don't have enough evidence to reject the new hypothesis. Okay, So an estimate that falls in the rejection region will tell us that the new hypothesis is unlikely. An evidence that falls in the expected region will say that the new hypothesis is still possible. Note that I'm here, I'm being very careful to use the words still possible and unlikely instead of just saying the new hypothesis is true or the new hypothesis is false. We will not in statistical inferences, we will not be able to say, oh, the new hypothesis is true or the new hypothesis is false. All that we can say is that the new hypothesis is more likely than the alternate hypothesis or less likely than the alternate hypothesis. Maybe there is a third hypothesis that we did not consider that is even better than the new hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis that we are studying. And that's why selecting the hypothesis carefully is very important. Anyway, let's focus on the new hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis for this video. So remember that the statistic that estimates a parameter is a random variable. So there's an error, and we can reach wrong conclusions. Okay. So for example, if the error of the statistic is too large, maybe the statistic falls in the rejection region even when the new hypothesis is true. Or if the parameter that if we choose a rejection region that is too small, the statistic can fall in the expected region even when the new hypothesis is not true. This will lead us to statistical errors, is that errors of statistical inference that we need to understand so that we can design the experiment correctly. So let's talk a little bit about the errors of statistical inference. There are two errors in statistical inference. Type 1 error, which is the false positive, and the type 2 error, which is the false negative. So let's talk about type 1 error. The type 1 error is when the data rejects the new hypothesis when the new hypothesis is true. So the probability of a false positive error happening is known in general. We call it the significance level of a test, or we call it the alpha of a test. So the alpha, the significance level, is the probability of a type 1 error, which is the probability that the data rejects the new hypothesis when the new hypothesis is true. We also call it the confidence level of a test. When, when we say confidence level, it usually means 1 minus alpha or 100% 1 minus alpha. So when we say a test has a 95% confidence, this means that the test has a 5% chance of having a false positive. So how can we control this? It's possible to control the type 1 error, and it's actually not very difficult to control the probability of the type 1 error. Now, the probability of the type 1 error is basically the size of the rejection region that we have. So let's say that our new hypothesis is that the mean of this chocolate is 300 grams. And we say that this, uh, the, this chocolate F mean is represented, the sample mean is represented as a normal curve. So these are the expected values for the chocolate given our hypothesis. As you can see here, there's a small chance right here that even if the new hypothesis is true that the mean of our sample will fall in the rejection region this is our type 1 error probability this is our alpha this is our um, 
confidence of the test. So it would be possible to reduce the probability of a type 1 error by increasing this delta. So the smaller our rejection region is, the smaller the probability of a type 1 error is. Of course, there are other consequences of choosing a smaller region. But if all that we worried about is not having type 1 error, we can reduce, we can increase this delta, reduce this rejection region, and reduce the probability of a type 1 error. Okay? So, basically, we are assuming, our new hypothesis is assuming that our distribution, uh, our packages are distributed along a normal. So we can expand it, the mean of the, nor the normal to be mu and the standard error to be sigma divided by the square root of n. This is the standard error of the sample mean. Okay, <clears throat> And it's very important to keep separate the sample mean and the distribution, the population mean. The population mean is the overall mean that we expect if we take one package randomly. The sample mean is the mean that we expect when we calculate a sample from that population. Okay? The sample error is the error that we can expect in that sample. So, we can calculate, the summaries that we can calculate delta to control exactly the probability of a sample mean failing to uh, in, falling in the rejection region. Now let's talk about the same type 2 error. The type 2 error is a little bit more complicated. It's the false negative. It's the error that happens when the data does not reject no hypothesis when the no hypothesis is false. Now the probability of a false negative error occurring is generally represented by the letter beta. So beta is the type 2 error, is also called the power of the test, and it's the probability that the data does not reject the new hypothesis when the new hypothesis is false. Okay? The power of the test is the sensitivity of the test to effects that violate the new hypothesis. So the larger the power, small variations will cause the test to reject the new hypothesis. A test that has a small power, sometimes we say a test that is underpowered, even if the effect is very large, it's possible that the test will not detect variations in the new hypothesis. So, for instance, if we have a test that has very small power, even if the, the, the machine is broken, if the difference between the broken machine and the machine working normally is very small, our test will not detect this data difference, and our test will say we cannot reject the new hypothesis. So, we want also to control the type 2 error to make sure that our test has enough power to detect the differences that we are interested in. So how do we interpret? Okay, so the type 1 error is very easy to interpret. We have the model of the new hypothesis and we see what is the probability that the mean of the sample would fall in the rejection region even if the model of the new hypothesis is true. The interpretation of the false negative is a little bit more difficult because if the model of the null hypothesis is not true, which one is true? We don't know. Okay, We don't know what is the true model. The alternate hypothesis does not specify one, only one model. For instance, in our case, the alternate hypothesis says that the mean is not 300 grams. But it could be anything. It could be 200 grams. It would be 100 grams. So the true value of the mean is the main factor of the probability of a type 2 error, and we don't control that. Okay? So, um, the, calcula so just, um, the calculation of the type 2 error is the area of the sampling region of the real parameter that would fall in the acceptance region. So if we have, this is our new hypothesis, this blue line is the new hypothesis. Let's say that our error was not very big, was close to the new hypothesis. In that case, as you can see, the probability of a type 2 error would be very big. However, imagine this second situation. In the second situation, the new hypothesis is the same, but the real mean is very far away from the new hypothesis. In this case, as you can see, the probability of a, of a type 2 error is very small. Okay, So the power of our test would be very big. So if we cannot control the true value of the, the mean, what can we do to try to reduce the probability of a type 2 error? So 
the, ta the power of a test has controllable factors, factors that we control, and uncontrollable factors. As I said before, the uncontrollable factor is the real value of the parameter. Also, the variance of the data is important and we don't control that. But there are a few parameters that we control. One is the significance level. So the bigger the significance of the test, the smaller is the power. The smaller the significance, the larger the power. Okay. <clears throat> also, the size of the sample, the bigger the sample, the larger the power of the test. So if we increase the sample size, we are also increasing the power of the test. However, even if we don't control the real value of the parameter, we can do something that's a little bit similar. We can say uh, we estimated the power of the test by defining a target defined difference. So this uh, new hypothesis minus alternate hypothesis. So we can define a value that we say, look, I cannot control exactly the power of the test, but I want to guarantee that my test is able to detect variations of at least 10 grams. Or maybe my test is able to detect variations of at least 5%. That is the target desired differ difference. Okay? So, when we use the target desired difference, the interpretation of the test becomes if the difference of the real value and the new hypothesis is at least this difference, then the probability of a type 2 error is better. So when we want to control the, the, the probability of a type 2 error, the, 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 the first thing that we need to do is to define this difference that we are interested in detecting. Differences is smaller than this, we don't worry. Even if there's a type 2 error, that's okay if the difference is smaller than this, it's not important. But if the difference is bigger than this, I want to know. Okay, so that's how we try to control the type 2 error. Okay, so looking at this, we can start to think about which error has each which consequence. So the type 1 error, the significance, only depends on the distribution of the new hypothesis. It's easy to control. The type 2 error, the power, depends on the real value of the parameter. It's more difficult to control. Because of this, we usually say that rejecting the, the H0 is a strong conclusion, but failing to reject the new hypothesis is a weak conclusion. Okay. Also, it's important to remember that because of this, because it's hard to control the type 2 error, failing to reject the new hypothesis is not evidence that the new hypothesis is true. It just says that the new hypothesis is better than the alternate hypothesis that was uh, proposed. Okay, now that we understand what are the different, uh, what are the different, the possible different results of a test, let's talk about the procedure. The procedure of the test is the following. First, we identify what parameter we are testing. Is it the mean? Is it the variance? Today, we're going to talk mostly about the mean. Then we define the new hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. We also need to define if the test is one-sided or two-sided. Today we're going to talk about two-sided tests. In the future we might talk about one-sided tests, but the difference is very, very small. Now, we determined the values for alpha and beta. We want to know what is the desired confidence level and what is the desired power. Based on the desired confidence level and the desired power, we define what is the minimal interesting side of effect, what is the minimal difference that we are interested in that is delta star. Using this parameter, we can calculate what is the sample size that we need to have alpha, beta uh, at the desired values. Based on the sample size, we can now define what is the test statistic, what is the function that we need to calculate to get the test, and what is the critical region, what is the value of that function that will lead us to reject new hypothesis. After we calculate all these parameters, we have prepared our test, and now we can do the experiment. We can now obtain the data and calculate the statistic. Based on the statistic calculated from the data, finally, we can decide if we reject the new hypothesis or if we do not reject the new hypothesis. Let's give an example. Let's change from chocolate to peas. So let's say that we have a brand of peas. Uh, let's do uh, our testing example here is we're going to estimate the mean of a normal distribution and we know the variance. Let's assume that we know the variance. So there's a certain brand of peas, and we want to determine if there is a deviation in the mean weight of the sex, for more or for less here now. Let's assume that the true variance of the process is small. We know the variance. So our hypotheses are H0, 
So mean mu is 50 grams. The mean of the the, the 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 mean of the distribution is 50 grams, and H1 the mean of the distribution is not 50 grams. So we want a, a significance level level of 0, 0, 0, 0. 0.05. We want a 95 percent significance. Now, given these characteristics, we expect that the sampling distribution of X is normal. And the variance of the sampling distribution is sigma squared divided by n, where n is the sample size, and sigma squared is the variance that we know. And if the H0 is true, the mean of the sampling distribution will be 50, we will be equal to the new hypothesis. Now, because we have this information, we can calculate a test statistic, Z0. Okay? So Z0 is the test statistic that will tell us if we can reject the new hypothesis or not. Z0 is the mean of the sample, which is x bar, minus the uh, mean of the, the population under the null hypothesis. So the difference between the mean of the sample and the expected mean of the population under the null hypothesis. We're going to divide this by sigma divided by the square root of the uh, number of samples. This equation gives us a, a variable that is this distributed under the standard normal. If you think about this, this equation a little bit, what is happening here? We're moving the distribution of the sample to the center. So we go, this, this should be zero. Okay, this, the, the expected value of this is zero. So that's the mean of the normal. And this is the variance of the, the sampling distribution. So we divided the variance by the variance of the sampling distribution and we should have one. So this value of C should follow a normal curve. This means that uh, with probability 1 minus alpha, the value of C0 will fall between the quantiles, the alpha bit divided by 2 quantile and the 1 minus alpha divided by 2 quantile. If you don't know the quantile word, check it on the dictionary. Quantile means what is the value of, uh, what are the numbers in a, in a distribution that have uh, that probability of happening. So. The probability of Z0 being between the alpha divided by 2 quantile of the Z distribution and the 1 minus alpha by 2 quantile of the Z distribution, if the new hypothesis is true, is 1 minus alpha. Okay? Now, this means that this defines our um, uh, critical region. If Z0 is smaller than the Z quantile alpha divided by 2, or if the Z0 is bigger, then the z quantile 1 minus alpha divided by 2, then we reject the new hypothesis with confidence 1 minus alpha. If not, if the z0 is between these values, then we fail to reject the new hypothesis. Let's assume, let's put some numbers to see how this calculates. Let's assume that our sample size is 10. And from the sample size, we calculate a mean estimate as 49.65. Let's assume also that we know the variance. The variance is one kilogram. Now we can calculate this is zero. This is zero will be 49.65 minus the mean of the null hypothesis divided by one, the variance, divided by the square root of the number of observations. This will give us minus 1.113. Now, what are the quantiles? If we look at the quantiles, there's a quantile table, or you can calculate that using a computer. The quantiles for the Z distribution is minus 196 and 196. Now, minus 1 is between these two values. So this means that we cannot reject the new hypothesis under the 95% confidence level. Let's give a second example. It's the same situation as before, but this time we do not know the variance. If we do not know the variance, what do we do? Also, just to change the number a bit, let's increase the confidence. Our confidence is now 99%, not 95%, 99%. It's a, we have a harder test that will be harder to have a type 1 error. But we don't know the, the variance, and we needed the variance to calculate the Z. So what do we do? Well, instead of using the Z, we are going to use the variance of the, uh, the, the, variance of the sample, the, the error of the sample, as a replacement for the variance. However, we know that the error of the sample is smaller when the sample is bigger. So the error of the sample is not a constant. It depends on the size of the sample. So we cannot use uh, the normal distribution 
because the error of the sample will change. The, the error of our model, the error of our new hypo the error of our new hypothesis will depend on the size of the sample. So what do we do? We use a different distribution called a student t distribution. Okay, student is the name of the person who re researched this. So the student t distribution. Student t distribution is a distribution that looks like a normal but has a, a variance that changes with the number of degrees of freedom which means that we can change the shape of this distribution depending on the size of our sample. So what we're going to do is that we have this, uh, this statistic that is the t0 and the top part is the same x the mean of our the mean of our sample minus the mean of the new hypothesis divided by the error of our sample divided by the square root of the number of samples. And this should be approximately distributed equal to a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So with the number depend the, the degrees of freedom depends on the size number of samples. So s here is the sample error and td is the t distribution. So let's put the calculation again. Now, from the same data used before, we know that x, the mean of the sample, is 49.6. And we calculate the error of the sample. The error of the sample is 0 0.6. So here, we, say, we calculate this and we see that our t0 will be minus 1.59. What are the critical values this time? Well, we're going to plug these values into the t-distribution calculator. And the t-distribution calculator says that for n minus 1 degrees of freedom, for 9 degrees of freedom, because we have 10 samples, and the, um, the quantile 0 0.005, so it's alpha divided by 2, so it will be minus 3.24 and plus 3.24 for the other side. So that means that under the new hypothesis, there's a 99% chance that the test statistic will give a value that is min between minus 3.24 and 3.24. Now, we calculated our value to be 1.559, which means that in this case, we can also not reject a new hypothesis. So we do not, again, we do not reject a new hypothesis, even if we didn't know the variance in this case. Now, you look at this equation. Oh my God, the equations, I'm worried. Not a problem. The idea of this course, it's important that you understand the equation because these equations will tell you what is the model that you are using to test this hypothesis. So by understanding the equation, and we're going to talk about this in the next video, you will understand what are the assumptions that our test make. And by understanding the assumptions, you will know if this is the right test for your experiment or if you should use a different test. But you don't need to calculate exactly the z0 or the t0 value and you don't need to know exactly what are the critical values for the t distribution or for the z distribution the computer does that for you for example if we use r we can replay we, we can repeat the calculation from the last slide using the t test function so we have the my sample so we run our experiment we put our experiment in a csv file we load it into my sample and then we run the t test function here is our new hypothesis, and here is our confidence level. And we can ch change other parameters in the test here. And it will give us the one sample t-test. And you see here, it's the same t-value, that we t0 value that we calculated before, 9 degrees of freedom. And here is our p-value. We're going to talk about this in the next video. And the result is <coughs> the t0 is minus 1. Um, so we see that in our confidence interval, it will fall here. So we see the t, t value here, and we know that it does not reject the new hypothesis. Okay. All right. So this is how we calculate a statistical test. In the next video, we'll talk a little bit more about what we understand from a statistical test. See you there.